Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. We are in our study of the Corinthian Letters, Lesson 28, entitled, Blueprints for a Happy Home, Part 2. Hello, welcome back to our midweek study. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're uh, not going to be reading necessarily 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We will be uh, probably next time we're coming together, but we started last time looking at this whole blueprints for a happy home and uh, using chapter 7, which is where God uh, in the New Testament speaks about marriage and through the, through the Holy Spirit, through Paul. And so uh, using that as a jumping off place to consider these blueprints. So we're going to do that. We're going to continue that. We're actually going to be asking you to turn. We did last time to Genesis. This time we're going to have to be turning to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be there for at least the next two times. So Ephesians chapter 5, continuing this process of blueprints for a happy home. This is part 2. So if you haven't listened to part one, back up, listen to part one first, and then you're ready for this one. So uh, these all stand alone, but they also do better if you take them in sequence. So, All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, your blueprints. You have blueprints for everything in life, not the least of which is marriage. And so, God, we so desperately need help uh, in this area. Our churches, our people, uh, we're hardly any different than the world, and uh Part of that has to do with the fact that we don't know your blueprints and we've based our marriages and our homes on something else. And until our lives are based upon your word, uh, we can't expect your promises to come true for us fully. Thank you, God, for this time. We pray you bless it in our ears and our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said last time, we started looking at uh, how can a marriage survive, not just, not just survive, but also thrive in the moral climate that we live in. And a very hard question with a very simple answer, uh, simple, simple to say anyway. Uh, the simple answer is the one who created us, the one who created marriage, holds the blueprints. And we have to go by what he says. Don't alter them, don't change them, don't take them as suggestions, take them as they're intended. God is giving us direction. This is the how it works. Since he created us and he created marriage, he alone holds the blueprint. So we're Considering that, we started last time a three-part look, and it's probably going to be now, I look like a, more like a four-part look, at uh, the blueprints for a happy home. God's blueprints for marriage can be summed up, as we saw last time, in three words. Leave, receive, and cleave. A man shall leave, it told us there in Genesis 2. His father and mother cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We went over two of these three words last time, leave and receive. We'll go over those briefly, and then we're going to get to cleave. We have to add that in there. And then we're going to be doing a little bit of, uh, I promise you last time, we're going to be having a, um, a vow renewal ceremony. So, so if you're not with your spouse, uh, I want you to come back and listen at least to that part when your spouse gets there. Because I, I want us to lead us in a vow renewal ceremony. If you are listening with your spouse, uh, it, by the way, if you're not married, listen all the way through. You don't have any vows to renew, and that's, that's fine. But if you are listening with your spouse, I want you to, you're going to be stopping and saying vows to each other. And so I'm going to have you do that. We're going to get to that in just a bit. But let's get back here to the blueprints. These are overall and general blueprints of how God created marriage. Don't deviate from these blueprints. Don't change these blueprints. Don't think they're suggestions. They are commands. Don't mess with them. Or they will mess, or the lack of you using them will mess with you. Number one, leave. It says leave father and mother. Why? Because your most important relationship a person has outside of marriage is the parent parental relationship. You're to leave that relationship, which means you're leaving all other relationships. including You're leaving yourself, because you're ceasing to be who you were. The two become one flesh. You were by yourself, one, and now there are two of you, and you've become one. The math doesn't work for you necessarily, but it is a miracle of God. You have to honor that. Leaving all relationships, you're not quitting these people. You just can't be who you were to them anymore. You can't especially be who you were to mom and dad or your friends because the two become one. Don't break those rules. Do not. Number one, leave. Number two, receive. Adam and Eve did not know, if you remember last time. A lot of people don't think through that. They did not know the hand that they were holding the day they got married. The day they got married was the day they met. How is it possible two people never met each other can get married happily and live a long life? By the way, these guys, 
Adam lived like 930 years, and I, I'm assuming Eve lived something like that. They were married for hundreds of years. No divorces. How'd they do it? Never met each other. The day they met was the day that they got married. They did not know the hand that they were holding that day. The only thing that they knew was the hand that was bringing them together. And that, according to the blueprints, is all that you need to know. Where did we get this idea? That we have to go look for our mate, our soulmate. I've got to find my soulmate. Let me just say this to you. I don't know where you got it, but it is not in the Bible. It's part of our culture. And, again, that's a separate set of blueprints. Now, you can run your life according to the blueprints of this world, but you should expect the results that come from that blueprint. Marriages are falling apart. Lives are being wrecked. Relationships are being wrecked because we are not following God's blueprints. God created this thing. He designs this thing. The first couple he puts together is the pattern. Adam and Eve didn't know the hand they were holding that day. I'm not saying don't go on a date with them. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you shouldn't meet their parents. I'm just, I'm just saying that can't be the reasons why you get married. You need to answer one simple question. Is this the person that God has? Are we the people that God has for us? That question is the make or break issue. doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter their background. doesn't matter their income level or how many credit card bills they have, etc. I mean, all those things are great to have. They're nice to look at. But nonetheless, they should not be making your decisions for you. The single decision that you're looking for is, is this the person that God has? Which, by the way, implies the fact that you're walking with God. So, <laughs> so wow, you're going to risk the most important decision you make in this life outside of accepting Christ? You're going to risk that decision to a faulty relationship you have with God. So you're not where you're walking with God, but you're out there dating. You're out there looking for a dude or looking for a gal. Oh, my goodness, soul and body, don't do that. You need to have, your relationship with God needs to be solid. You need to be sold out to Him and sold out to His purposes and His blueprints. And then you're ready to say, God, who do you have for me? And God be say, may be saying, I got that right person ready for you. Or he may be saying, you need to wait. It's up to him. He calls the shots. What makes us think that we have any say in such a crucial decision? Adam didn't. Adam was perfect. So tell me how you're doing. <laughs> how you doing, ma'am? So you're not perfect. But Eve was, and she got no say in whether she got Adam. Sir, you're not perfect. But Adam was, and he had zero to say about Eve. He got put to sleep. He woke up. There was Eve. One option for both of them. Again, the first marriage, original blueprints, is based not on looks, not on performance, not on knowledge, not on anything other than they knew that God wanted them to be together. This is crucial. This is crucial. Don't break these rules. Now, does God work around these rules when we're just stupid? Sure he does. There's, there's, there's marriages out there that have been awesome, God-ordained, and they didn't know the rules. But, but it's not the way God intends things to be. God intends us to follow what he says, to honor what he says, to know him. And by the way, you now know the rules, so you're obligated to them. Stick to the rules. Don't break the blueprints. Don't go with another set. So number one, leave. Number two, receive. Number three, here's the new territory. Cleave, and a man shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Cleave is a word of permanence. Uh, it's a lifetime word. It's an act of God, not the act of two people, and though we say the sex act is the marriage act, and it indeed is, but it's still an act of God because Jesus tells us that very clearly, what God has joined together. Now, it wasn't your minister, and it wasn't your honeymoon. It was God. Let no man separate. So you separate that thing, you're messing with God. You're, you're destroying what he created. Swallow hard. Swallow hard. You plan on getting married, swallow hard. You're dealing with something very sacred, something that God creates, and you're going to mess it up. Be careful. Make sure you're getting in wisely. Unity, this unity, this cleaving is the unity of persons on all levels. It doesn't happen in any other relationship. Unity of flesh, unity of emotions, unity of spirit. Uh, 
spiritual in the spiritual in the sense that, that God has joined us together, and so therefore now we together seek God, the one who put us together. It's a unity of flesh because this is why God reserves sex for only for marriage. That's why he does that. There's a good reason for it. Again, he's just trying to help us. He's not trying to steal our joy, steal our fun. No, he's trying to make it fun. He's trying to make you happy. Let him do it. Follow the blueprints. Cleave is a word that refers to an alloy in ancient Hebrew in which the New Old Testament was written in. And alloy is when you take two different kinds of metal, get them super hot, turn them into liquid, pour them together, and when they solidify, they are joined. They, they remain separate metals. There hasn't been a chemical reaction. There's just been a physical reaction, and they're joined together in a way that they can never be separated again. That is the word. Cleave. They will be separate metals, but they will remain inseparable. No separate lives anymore. No more. You cannot run your married life like your single life, or you will get to be single again. Again, you break these blueprints, and that's why things aren't working. No more separate lives. He doesn't have a problem, ma'am. Y'all have a problem. My husband has a problem. No, you both have a problem. You're married. My wife has a problem. No, you have a problem, sir, because she's your wife. No more, uh, no more him and me. It's us collectively. N none of that other stuff. Don't break. All has been cleaved together. Don't break those rules. Psalm 127. Classic verse. Wow, I don't see it. Don't know where I'll put it. Hang on. Well, this is it, but I didn't put the... I didn't, put the right, uh, I didn't put the right heading. It says up there, Matthew 16, 24 and 25. That's not what it is. This is Psalm 120. The verse below it is Psalm 127, verse 1. So let's read it. Unless the Lord builds the house. Here's the blueprints. They who in build, in build it labor in vain. Got a lot of people getting married, trying to work on their marriage, but they're not going to do it the way God wants them to do it. So guess what? You build a lot of vanity... You're building a whole, there's a lot of vain stuff being built out there. I'm working on it, but not doing it God's way. Life doesn't work any other way. Not marriage, not anything. So, so let's stop. We've had enough preaching for a minute. Let's stop and have a little marriage ceremony. You ready? So I ask you to find your spouse, and if you hadn't found your spouse, you might want to come back to this spot or skip this spot and go on to the rest of our study here in just a second. But we're going to take a, take a few minutes here, and we're going to renew our vows. So what I want you to do, you're there with your husband or wife, and again, you can come back to this, I know, you may not be there, or, you know, whatever, but it's not going to take long, but I want you to renew your vows, so I want you to stand up, I want you to face each other, I want you to hold hands, you ready to go? I'm serious about this, stop the, stop the video till you can get this done, go out and get a flower or something, I don't know, don't have to, don't have to do that, it, it's what you mean in your heart that matters, just as married either way, so, so you ready? Here we go. Dearly beloved, we're gathered this day to see these couples renew their marriage vows together. Husband is going to go first. Husband, I want you to look into your wife's eyes, and I want you to repeat after me. I, fill in the blank, take you to be my wedded wife. One more time. I want to renew my promise to you. I want to renew my promise to God. I will continue to love you, honor you, stay with you, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Now, ladies, wives, it is your turn. Hold your husband's hand, look into his eyes, repeat after me. I, fill in the blank, take you to be my husband one more time. I want to do my promise to you. I want to do my promise to God. I want to continue to love you, honor you, and stay with you. For better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, 
in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. All right, now you've said your vows. I want you to hold on to each other's rings. I'm assuming you gave each other's rings or where the ring should be. Maybe you don't have it on. I don't know. I want you to hold on to those rings, look into each other's eyes, and I want you both simultaneously to repeat after me. Are you ready? These rings will continue to be lasting symbols of our faithfulness to each other. And as much as you've renewed your vows, it is my privilege to pronounce you one more time, husband and wife. You may now kiss. So now we're ready. Continue our Bible study. One of the greatest tests of Christianity is in the home, not in church. Everybody's good in church, for the most part. It's in the house, and specifically in your marriage, where Christianity, the rubber, meets the road. So that's why we're dropping down and making careful considerations of this whole issue of marriage. Not just because it's in shambles, because it definitely is, but because it's the spot where Christianity starts. Can't expect to be any better than who I am when I'm by myself with my wife. Who I am there is who I'm going to be eventually out here. So if I'm not good there, I will not be good out here. So we've got to fix that. We're going to be doing that. We're going to be considering, we've already considered God's overall blueprints for marriage in general. Leave, receive, and cleave, right? Now we're going to be looking at specific blueprints. First of all, the husband's specific blueprints, his job, his role in the marriage, and then the wife's blueprints the next time, probably the end of the next time together. The rest of the time here in the beginning of the next time we'll be looking at the husband. So, so for the first time, like I said, we're going to first look at these husbands, and maybe at this point, wife, you would like to turn to your husband and say, I've been waiting for this sermon. <laughs> well, um, hers is coming, sir, just so you know. But you get to go first. So let's take a look, guys, for our page in the blueprints and gals. Uh, our page, our, our, the entire page of our blueprints collectively is here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. Here we have the New Testament description and broader explanation of all that it means to be married as a Christian, as children of God, Bought and saved, heaven-headed, heaven-bound, uh, uh, living here on earth with the responsibilities of portraying to the world who we really are and what God has really done in our lives. Here's where it starts at home. Wives, verse 22, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. Husbands, you might want to underline that word, Savior. That's an important word. We'll get to that. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with the water with the word, that he might present himself, present her to himself in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Who wouldn't do that, right? For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. We are one with Christ. For this cause, a man shall leave. Here he is quoting from where we were back there in Genesis chapter 2. For this cause, what cause? For the cause of marriage. For the cause of what God created, this holy, sacred relationship. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a mystery. Like I said, the math doesn't work. Two plus two does not equal one. I mean, one plus one does not equal one. This is a mystery. It's great. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The ultimate marriage is Jesus and the church. The skit, if you want to think of it that way, in fact, let's do that. The skit, the play that represents the original relationship 
which, by the way, is Christ and the church. Jesus was sacrificed for the church, the Bible says, before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God and plan of God, Jesus, his sacrifice, his death to buy us, to purchase us back from our sin, was a done deal before God ever created Adam and Eve. So, so their marriage is created as a skit, as a role play of the original relationship and marriage between Christ and the church. So this is a very sacred relationship. It's incredibly important. Cannot overstate how crucial this is, how holy it's supposed to be, and how serious we should be taking our roles as husbands and wives. This is not something to play around with. Oh, I think we'll just get married. Wow, this is nothing flipping at all. This is serious business. These to be entered into very solemnly, very carefully, very crucial that you have a close relationship with God in that process and all the way through for that matter. So, so again, we have now our roles, our blueprints being laid out for us, and we're the skit, husband and wife, representing the real relationship, Christ and his church. Never forget that. So in that skit, what role do you play? Well, we're looking at the husband. We're after him first, then we're going to get after the wife. In the marriage relationship, the husband, hear me on this, has the hardest job. Ladies, you may say, that's not true. Women have it harder. Da-da-da-da-da. Okay, I didn't write the Bible, neither did you. The Bible says, I'm going to show it to you, the husband has the hardest job. Here's the reason why. In the skit called marriage that represents Christ in the church, your husband is Jesus. I don't want to do that. I don't like that myself. I never claim to be Jesus. I want to be imperfect. I want to be selfish. I want to be, I don't know, a bonehead. I want to be immature, and I want to be okay to do that. Well, the Bible doesn't let me do that as a husband. It says, you know what, Bill? In this skit called marriage, you're Jesus. You play his role. Husband, how do I know that your relationship, in the relationship, your job is the hardest? Because you get to play Jesus. How are you doing with that? Or maybe, ma'am, how's he doing with that? He just, just like Jesus? And like I said, the wife's role is easier, but only in the sense that your husband is just like Jesus. Like I said, I understand, ladies, you're saying, oh, my role is really hard. Yeah, because, yeah, I know, because your husband's got a long ways to go, doesn't he? Yeah, you both do. So, so uh, all, that, all that being said, we need to know what, what's, the, what's the standard here. So the standard is, husband, your role is the role of Jesus in the relationship. Not to the rest of the world, just between you and your wife, just as much as between Christ and the church, in this role, you are Jesus. In this skit, you're Jesus. What does, here's the question, since you're playing Jesus, what does loving your wife as Christ does the church look like? Important question. The role of, the role of husband is that of Savior. That's what it says. Got it again. The role of husband, the role of the husband is that of Savior. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. So Jesus is the Savior of the church. Husband is the Savior of the marriage. I don't like that. Me neither. Guess what? We don't get to choose. These are the blueprints. And the reason why marriages aren't working is because we're not going by the blueprints. That's what it says. Makes me very uncomfortable as a husband. Yeah. Because how can I be Jesus? Right. It's tough. Tough. You don't get to decide what that looks like. He tells us. Your role is that of Savior. I said, I told you, it's a tough role. It's tough. Husbands, listen, we lead our homes as saviors, not as dictators, certainly not as abdicators. We lead our role as saviors. Could your practice as husband be described as saving? Are you the savior in this relationship? How, 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 maybe, ma'am, how's he doing with that? 
wow, you see these standards? God has them up here. We have them way down here. I get to be an idiot. I get to play around. I get to be an older boy now just with bigger toys. <sighs> no, that's why marriages aren't working. Because we aren't playing in the role that God created us according to his blueprints. Husbands, your role is that of Christ, and particularly in your leadership style, is that of Savior. We lead as Christ leads. How did he lead? With no thought for himself whatsoever. Swallow hard. No thought for himself. If Jesus had thought for himself, he would not have come. He did not think of himself. He laid everything that he had down for the sake of the church, including his life. How you doing with that, husband? You, hear me, set the tone in the family. Family isn't going good. I know whose fault it is. It's yours. I, you know, I, I don't like it either. But God is the one that said it, it rises, the tone of the family rises and falls on leadership. You're the leader. You're the leader. How you doing with that? So here we give definition of leadership. I'm going to put it on the screen for you here. Here's the definition. Here's the leader showing us how to lead. John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. Jesus got up. This is the night he's betrayed. Here's how he leads. This was his attitude. This was the attitude and, and ultimately the action here the night he was betrayed. Got up from supper, laid his outer garments aside. This is Jesus. This is the role you're playing, gentlemen. Took a towel, tied it around himself, and then he poured water into a basin and began washing his disciples' feet and wiping them with the towel which he had tied around himself. He took on the role of a servant. That's how you lead. This is Jesus teaching you how to be a husband. That's what it is. This is how to lead as the savior of the home. That attitude. I've got to wash my wife's feet every night? That's not what it says. It's not what it's talking about. You've got to do whatever. Whatever a savior needs to do in your home. You're it, gentlemen. You're the guy. You're the only one. Not another one coming. You're it. The husband is the leader in the sense that he represents Christ in a relationship. Sir, do not take it lightly. Take it very seriously. Because as the leader, so goes the family. He sets the tone in the relationship. Of course, the famous phrase, if mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, ain't true. Because as the husband goes, so goes the family. I didn't write it. It's not my blueprints, it's his. As the husband goes, so goes the family. And I know the wife has, she has a mind of her own, certainly. The kids certainly do. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the tone is set by the husband. He sets the tone. Because why? He plays the role of the Savior. No one else can play that role. Right? No, one else, no one else plays that part. You are it, sir. You are it. The husband sets the tone according to the blueprints of God. He sets the pace and the example. He sets the course of the home and the marriage. Jesus is the Savior, right? He sets the example and tone for our lives. In the marriage, the husband is the Savior and servant of the home and sets the tone for the marriage and for the home. Take or leave it. That's the blueprints. So let me, if in case this hadn't hit you over the head hard enough, let me... Rephrase. By the way, that's the here. Here we have Jesus who setting the tone for how, how what our servant leadership is supposed to look like as the saviors in the home. John chapter thirteen. Here he continues. Here's how the end of that whole situation of him washing the disciples suit. Here's here's how it ended. He says, "You call me teacher and Lord, and you're correct, for so I am. So if I, the Lord and teacher," Wash your feet, so also you ought to wash one another's feet. Notice, as Savior, as leader, he sets the tone. And that's the tone, that you would go and be just like him. So, so, so let me ask you something, gentlemen. If your kids go and your wife goes and act just like you, what's that look like? So if you're acting like a big old kid, selfish brat, what's the tone? You set the tone. 
You set the tone. I know your wife's a strong-minded woman. I got one of those too. I'm telling you, she doesn't set the tone. Because why? Because that's the way God created it. It's got nothing to do with personality. It's got nothing to do with giftedness. It has everything to do with role. In the role of Christ, you are in that home. Like I said, take or leave it. This is the Bible. These are the blueprints. I'm just shooting as straight as I know how to shoot with you. So, so let, me, let me paraphrase the, what Jesus just said. Because I want us to apply it. I want us to change the names or the titles here so it applies directly to us. Because Jesus is, again, telling us how to husband. Because he's husbanding the church right here. Washing their feet. Setting the tone. Providing the example. Notice what he says. You call me teacher and Lord. And so you're correct. So I am. So if I, the Lord, and the teacher, wash your feet, so also you ought to also wash one another's feet. Let's change some words and apply it to us. You call me husband and head and father. So I am. Rightly so. For now, as you've seen me do, go and do likewise. So how, what are they seeing, sir, in you? Because they will do likewise. Because you set the tone. Because they call you husband and leader, and they are right. For so you are. Because that's the way God ordained it. But what are you leading them to? So you have such great responsibility, such a grave responsibility. And it's because of the abdication of our responsibility, husbands, that our homes. Rough. I'm not saying the wife doesn't have problems. It doesn't, doesn't ha add to that problem. We're going to get to her. We're not done with you. But we're going to stop right there because this is enough to swallow, I think. It's a, it's a lot to chew on. So I hope you'll pr prayerfully consider it. Uh, review this lesson. Review the last one because, like I said, these blueprints are so far from the way that we typically think. So far from how we naturally assume marriage and entering into marriage, dating, etc., is actually supposed to go. The Bible holds a totally different position. And because it holds, because we do not follow that totally different position is the reason why we're in the situation that we're in today, as far as marriage and relationships go. So take it for what it's worth. It's worth everything. And follow it. So I want you to chew on that. I want you to think about that. And again, if you haven't gone through this, the vow ceremony, I want you to do that. And uh, uh, we're going to come back next time, and we're going to take another shot at it. So, okay? So uh, God bless you in that, and let's pray together. God, we thank you for calling us and not leaving anything up to our imaginations. We don't get to make our own definitions. But instead, you very clearly define what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to be. And so we have to say, God, help us. We are so far from what we're supposed to be. God, help us to determine, first of all, that we wouldn't do anything else except for the role you called us to be in, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, we have such a grave responsibility we have such a short time. Thank you, God. I pray your blessings over our marriages. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.